Good evening and welcome to worship here at Concord. I want to start out tonight by just thanking Dr. Cox for giving me the opportunity to share this message with you. It's always a privilege for me to be able to preach God's Word and I want to thank all of you for joining me here tonight. Well, as we all know, this is now week six of our quarantine and after speaking with many of you over that span of time, I know just how badly we all want to get back together. We all want to see each other again and get things back to normal. Several of you have told me just how much you miss being able to go to church and to worship and to fellowship together. And I know for me, not being able to, to interact with my church family has been one of my greatest struggles throughout all of this as well. So tonight, I want us to take a little closer look at our current situation by looking back at an old, old story from Scripture that I think can teach us something really important as we wait for that day when we can gather together again. But before we get to that really old story, I want to take you back to another old story, this one straight from our history books. It's a story of what we know as the White House. We all know that the White House is the official residence for an acting U.S. president. But did you know that not all U.S. presidents lived in the White House? No, history tells us that George Washington did, in fact, uh, choose the property on which the president's house would be built right there off of Pennsylvania Avenue. And construction did, in fact, begin during his time in office. But he never lived there. They didn't receive what we call the CO, or the Certificate of Occupancy, until the year 1800 when John Adams was actually president. The house itself was initially called the President's House, not the White House as we know it today. And it wasn't completely built in 1800, but President Adams moved in anyway. And he lived there throughout his term and of course was immediately followed by both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. As a matter of fact, James Madison and his wife Dolly were the last to live in the president's house because soon after taking office, Madison and America found themselves at odds once again with Britain, this time entrenched in the War of 1812. And it was on the night of August 24th, 1814, that British troops invaded Washington, D.C. and burned down almost the entire city, including the president's house. It was destroyed by the fire that raged all night long into the next morning. As a matter of fact, it caused James Madison to live in a hotel for the next couple of years. Well, after the war, architect James Hoban was commissioned to rebuild a new residence for the president. And in the year 1817, three years after the fire, the White House, as we know it, became the new home site for every American president since. Well, of course, it's undergone several renovations over the years, but it continues to serve its purpose and it continues to be one of the most popular tourist attractions for people all over the world. As a matter of fact, uh, my family had a tour planned uh, of the White House just back at spring break a few weeks ago, and it was canceled, of course, because of COVID-19, which did not make my wife and kids very happy at all. But you know, as we think about our, our nation's history, and we think specifically to the history of these two buildings that I've talked about tonight, I want us to go back in time in Jewish history, a time where God's people too were rebuilding and trying to establish something in their history. As you may already know, the saddest, most disappointing time in Old Testament Scripture has to be the exile of God's people. History tells us that the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in the year 587 B.C., destroying everything in their path, including the temple, which was originally built by King Solomon. The Israelites were then taken into captivity and they were scattered throughout the Babylonian Empire. And during that 70-year period of time, when the Jews were exiled away from Jerusalem, away from their homeland, I imagine it seemed to them as if God had abandoned them. It was definitely the darkest time in Jewish history. And that's where I want us to begin tonight as we too find ourselves exiled, if you will, exiled from each other and exiled from our place of worship. Like I said, it's now been six weeks since we last met together physically, and I know that we all long to return home as soon as we possibly can. But until that day comes, I want us to prepare ourselves now so that when we are able to get back together, we'll know exactly what to do. 
So tonight I want us to go back to a great little book in the Old Testament, one that you may not be all that familiar with, but one that I think we should be. It can give us some insight into that day when we're able to gather together again. The book I'm talking about is the great book of Ezra, and it consists of the events that immediately follow the Jewish exile. And it provides some lessons we can learn as we move forward together. So go ahead and find your Bibles, find the book of Ezra. We're going to be in chapter 3 today. I know that may not be a book that you can flip to very quickly. Uh, it's right after 2 Chronicles, right before Nehemiah, if that helps any. Uh, I'll give you a little time to get there, but we're going to be in Ezra chapter 3. And I'm going to begin tonight by just reading the first few verses, and then we'll dive in to see what we can learn. So Ezra chapter 3, in your Old Testament, we're going to look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Follow along with me as I read. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled into their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, son of Josadak, and a fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. All right, let's stop right here for a moment to consider what's going on in our story. So there they are. There are the Israelites. They've made their way back home from Babylon. And we read here in verse 1 something very important. We read that the Israelites are assembled together as one very important time in Jewish history because it's the first time in a long time that they gathered as one. Even before the exile, they weren't one. They weren't a people of one. They weren't together in that way. So it's nice to see them coming back together. After the exile, they're together as one. Cyrus, king of Persia at the time, had given them the green light to return home from Babylon and between 40 and 50,000 Israelites made the four-month journey from Babylon back to the Promised Land, their homeland. And we would, when we begin reading in Ezra chapter 3, we can almost, if we use our imaginations, we can picture them a little bit, can't we? I know I see them. I kind of see them slowly walking through the rubble of their once great city. I imagine it was probably quiet, a time filled with reflection, a time filled with memories flooding back into each person's mind of a life that I imagine they all thought was lost. They were happy to be home, I'm sure, but I imagine all of them had a question. Maybe they all had the question, but they were too afraid to ask it. What are we supposed to do now? What do we do now? Remember, they had lived in Babylon for 70 years. Many of them were born in Babylon. This was the first time they had ever been back to the city of their ancestors. Life had changed completely for them, and now they're all trying to readjust. So what was going to be priority number one for those people? Everything they had been through, everything that they had endured for 70 years, what was going to be the first thing, their first act as a community? Well, after taking some time to simply settle in, we read that for them, priority number one was worship. The priests got together and built an altar to the Lord, and they started offering sacrifices to God just like they used to. Remember, they still weren't free at this point. They were just allowed to move back home under Persian rule instead of being held captive under Babylonian rule. So they were still somewhat nervous, somewhat unsure of the consequences of their actions. But yet they pushed on anyway and began to worship. You know, of all the things that they could have done, Maybe even safer things like built homes or started businesses or dividing up the land. None of those things were their top priority. It was worship that took precedent over everything else. Earlier this week, Governor McMaster announced that school will be canceled for the rest of the year in South Carolina. That means our, our graduating seniors won't experience all the things that we got to experience that when we graduated, when we were seniors. Things like their graduation ceremonies, or their proms, or their awards days. I know in my house, lost baseball seasons have been a sore spot for two of my sons. 
We've had to celebrate three different birthdays in my family while quarantined, unable to have the traditional birthday party or to have the celebratory dinner at our favorite restaurants. We haven't been able to fellowship with family and friends the way we'd want to, the way we like to, the way we usually do. And like I mentioned earlier, we had a family vacation to Washington, D.C. canceled because of the virus. And I'm sure we all have a long list of things that we want to do as soon as we're allowed to get back out and do things again. But the question I have for you right now is, where does worship fall on your list? Is it priority number one, or maybe is it somewhere a little farther down the line? Let's consider for a moment why worship was at the top of the Israelites' list. You see, they had lived in Babylon for an entire generation. And some of them did the unthinkable while there. Some of them did the worst thing they could have possibly done, and that was they adopted Babylonian culture, Babylonian practices, Babylonian religion. They adopted some of their idols as their own gods. Some Jews abandoned their faith in Yahweh altogether and became like the Babylonians. Yet there were others, men like Daniel that we're familiar with from Scripture, they took the prophet Jeremiah's advice and lived good, clean, honest lives while in Babylon. They lived there, worked there, and even supported Babylon to some degree. But they never sacrificed their relationship with God. You see, during their 70-year exile, many continued to worship God faithfully, just like they always had. You remember Daniel's story, don't you? He worked his way up through the ranks of King Darius's government, finally reaching the, the lofty position of administrator, which meant he was over the 120 satraps whose job it was to rule throughout the kingdom, basically. And because of Daniel's impeccable character and his abilities, the king planned to make him second in command over the entire empire, the entire kingdom, which made, as you can imagine, made a lot of other people quite jealous. So what did they do? they set out to tear Daniel down. They had Darius issue a decree stating that anybody who prays to any god or any other man besides him, besides the king, shall be, you know the story, thrown into the lion's den. You may ask, why was that the plan they devised to take down Daniel? Well, it's because they knew Daniel would be guilty. He was a man of great faith an obedient follower of God who made worship a priority in his life regardless of his location or his circumstances. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, we read these words. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. You see, Daniel, like many others, continued to worship even during this 70-year time of exile. The Bible tells us that even after hearing Darius' new decree, he still went home and prayed just like he always had. Worship remained a part of Daniel's life just like it remained part of the lives of many other Israelites during that time. Which explains to us why the very first thing they did as a people once they were able to go back home and gather together was build an altar. It was to worship. Let me make this point to you tonight. You see, whatever is top priority during the exile, or in our case, during the quarantine, will in turn be our top priority after the exile and after the quarantine. Let me say that again. Whatever is top priority for you now will remain your top priority once all of this is over. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, what do you long for most today? What do you miss the most? When you get back from your exile, what will be your first act as a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, it's like anything else, really. We need to, to stay in practice because if we take too much time off, we lose something. As you all know, all of you who know me well, know that I love to play golf, and I've played golf all my life. You've heard me tell stories about my golf career many times over the years. So I bet you'll find it interesting to know that I haven't played golf in almost a year. Almost a full year, I've not hit a shot. 
That's the longest stretch without playing that I've ever had in my life. And do you want to know why it's been so long for me? There's other things that have gotten in the way. I've gotten busy. The kids are doing things. Yeah, there's a lot of other reasons. But the main reason for it is because after a month, two months, six months without playing, it was no longer a priority for me. I stopped looking for opportunities to play. I guess it's like the old saying, out of sight, out of mind. And you know, worship can be the exact same way. If we stop worshiping during the quarantine, we won't be looking to worship after it. So one day, hopefully sooner rather than later, our church doors will reopen and we'll be free to return. And the only way we'll all come back ready to worship is if we're all continuing to worship right now. You know, but after experiencing everything that we've experienced throughout this unusual season of our lives, I'm not real sure if it'll ever go back to the way it was. And to be honest with you, I hope it doesn't. I hope we don't just go back to the way it was. I look back at Ezra chapter 3. Join me again in Ezra chapter 3 and let's look back at the end of that chapter. Let's jump down to verse 10. What we read between verses 3 and 10 is the Israelites' decision to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. The priests got together and they called on others to come forward to, to lend a hand with the construction. I guess you could say they played a similar role to that of James Hoban when he was called to come back and rebuild the president's house in Washington. But as they started working and they laid the foundation for the new temple, we read in verse 10 that not everybody was as excited about it as we think they should be. Look there with me again in Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But listen to this. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. What Ezra is telling us here is that there were some folks who were alive before the exile who still remembered the old temple, how majestic it was, how amazing it was, how beautiful it was. We all know Solomon spared no expense when building that first house of the Lord. And the older guard was very proud of it, even though it was nothing more than rubble under their feet at that time. The problem they had with the new temple, its size. It was too small. It wasn't as big as the old one. It wasn't as good as the old one, they thought. And this disappointed them greatly. You see, they wanted things to go back to the way they were before. They wanted to basically just recreate what they already had. They didn't want the exile to change them, but it had. And God set out to remind them that the building is not the most important thing. It was their relationship with Him and their relationship with each other that really mattered. My wife Ashley and I have been leading a brief time of devotion for our Sunday school class during this time. We do it online, and we've been working through a devotion on gratitude. We've been trying to remind ourselves to continue to be grateful even during a time when it's not always the easiest thing to do. You know, we're all striving for that. We're striving to be grateful to God for everything He's doing during these difficult times. And I know for me personally, my attitude has changed. My priorities, I would say, are back in order now as a result of our exile. And I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful to God for that. There's no doubt in my mind that I've been changed as a result of this season in my life, as a result of this dreaded virus. And it's all because God and His sovereignty and His providence knows exactly what we need and when we need it. Things that used to rival worship for my heart's affections no longer all that important to me. I don't think I'll ever view corporate worship the same again now that it's been taken away from me. 
And I'm okay with that because sometimes we all just need a change of heart and a change of mind. And I bet most of you probably need that change too. I hope church and worship looks differently when we all get back together again. I don't want to go back to the old way because I think we've done some remarkable things during our exile. I've heard numerous stories of how you're all reaching out to each other, whether it's by phone or email or Zoom meetings. I've heard many of you who have said you started family devotion time. You're gathering together on the couch at night with your kids and your, your spouses. You're reading the Bible together for the first time ever. I've heard stories of how several of you have helped others get groceries and pay bills in order to prevent them from being exposed to the disease. I've noticed how many of you are sharing our videos that, uh, that we have of services and Sunday school lessons on Facebook with people who don't attend church anywhere. And they're hearing the gospel for the very first time because of the circumstances that we're in right now. I hope we keep that going because isn't that really what the church is? Isn't that really what we should all want to be? So what will be that first Sunday for you? What's it going to look like for you when we all come back to the altar once again? I hope it looks much like the Israelites when they returned home. I hope worship is priority number one. But the only way it will be is if it already is. I heard one pastor say this week, and I think he's exactly right. He said, the activity of worship, glorifying and enjoying God, is the central practice of the church. It is this practice that most clearly sets the church apart, that most clearly displays our calling and constitutes the church as a community. You see, the world will be watching when God's people reconvene one day. What will the world see? Will we gather as one to worship the Almighty God of heaven or will be, maybe we'll be focused on something else? Maybe we won't be here at all. Maybe we're going to think about work or social outings or vacations that we haven't been able to take. You know, there were some Israelites who abandoned God while they were in exile and they adopt, adopted the Babylonian idols, as I mentioned earlier. Let's not follow that lead. Let's not let the other things of this world become more important to us than our relationship with God. Let's remain focused together. I hope God and the world around us finds us worshiping the very first day back. And I hope they only hear shouts of joy coming from Concord Baptist Church on that day when we all get back together to worship. It'll be a new day. It'll be a new era but I hope the top priority remains the same as it's always been, to worship the sovereign God of the universe. So don't fall out of practice during this time. For whatever is important during the exile will remain important after the exile. Thank you so much for being with me tonight. I long for the day when we're all back together again. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this time as difficult as it is, Lord, I thank you for using it for, your good, for our good and your glory. Lord, I know that many of us are learning new lessons. We're learning to put our priorities back in order. And Lord, we know that you are at work today, doing amazing things in the lives of those who call on your name. Lord, continue to work through us and in us during this time. Prepare our hearts for when we are able to return. And Lord, I pray that worship will be the first thing that we all long to do. Lord, we want to give you all the glory today as you continue to see us through a difficult time. And Lord, I want to give you the praise and glory when it's all said and done. Your love for us is amazing. Your faith in us it endures forever. And Lord, I pray that we remain as faithful to you as you have been to us. And we ask all this in the awesome and holy name of Jesus. Amen.